Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are waiting for a few more participants. Kindly bear with us. Thank you. Happy New Year, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening. We are super excited to welcome you all to Vantage Point Masterclass with Mr. Robert Hatsworth, CIO and author of bestseller book, The Warren Buffet Way. The masterclass will be hosted by Nitin Shanba, Head Investment Products, Motilal Oswal Wealth. He has over two decades of experience in financial markets. Mr. Hatsworth will be sharing insights on his book, and a physiological foundation of Buffet's approach. For best audio, please use your headphones or headsets. If you have any questions, please type in the Q&A box located at the bottom of Zoom page. We will try and answer most of it. In case any of your questions are missed, please feel free to connect with your relationship manager. Thank you, everyone. Over to you, Nitin. Hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for, for joining us uh, today. Uh, I am as excited uh, as you to... So if you can just give us a minute, please. Okay, uh, folks, as I mentioned, uh, very excited to, to be here with, uh, with all of you today. Uh, and indeed, since we are going to talk about Mr. Warren Buffett, uh, the, the greatest investor uh, who is with us, and uh, you know, to, to discuss more about his principles of investing, including the author of the book, The Warren Buffett Way, uh, I have with me uh, Robert Hackstrom. Uh, good morning to you, uh, Robert. <laughs> Nitin, uh, good evening to you uh, in India. Very nice to be with you. Thank you for the uh, invitation. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us, Robert. Uh, just before we start off, uh, a brief introduction uh, to Robert. He's the Chief Investment Officer and Senior Portfolio Manager at Equity Compass. Uh, he has over 30 years of uh, investment experience, uh, and he joined Equity Compass in 2014, prior to which... Uh, he was the Chief Investment Officer at Leg Mason Capital Management for 14 years, where he uh, managed about $7 billion of assets. Uh, along with the Warren Buffett way, uh, you know, Robert is also the author of six other investment books. You know, I've had a great pleasure reading, uh, reading this book, and I'd request all of you, uh, if you do happen to get a chance to go through it, uh, it's extremely, extremely uh, enriching. And over the course of this conversation, uh, I'm going to take the liberty of uh, discussing with Robert on some of his other books, uh, including uh, the new investing 
which outlines uh, uh, a new approach uh, based on the ideas of two highly successful other investors, uh, one Mr. Charlie Munger and Bill Miller of uh, Lake Mason. Uh, now, before I kickstart uh, this, this session, I'd like to bring up uh, a chart, you know, about Warren Buffett. And in that chart uh, is, is all that we want to know about the success of Warren Buffett. I mean, one of the key successes of any uh, investor is also measured by the kind of network that he creates uh, for himself uh, over a long period of time. And uh, that chart will come up to you in just about a minute. So as you can see on, on this particular chart, uh, this kind of details uh, how uh, Mr. Buffett's uh, net worth has actually increased over time. Uh, and it's, it's testimony to, to his uh, patience, really, and having the ability to spend a long time uh, in the financial markets. Uh, just to give you a little bit of sense, according to Forbes, uh, Mr. Buffett's net worth is uh, around $121.5 billion as we speak, and he's currently the sixth richest person in the world uh, today. Uh, and as you can see from this chart, 99% of his net worth was created after his 50th uh, birthday, and he's 93 uh, today. So I just wanted to leave you uh, with this. Uh, just to give you a sense of what we are talking about. It's, it's all about patience and rational allocation to capital, and we'll dwell more on that uh, going forward. But uh, now coming back to you, Robert, uh, on this book, uh, firstly, great book, uh, just want to dwell into what really inspired you uh, to go uh, and, and author this book. You know, one of the things that you do mention is that change is constant, but the investment principles have endured, and, and Mr. Warren Buffett uh, kind of uh, reiterates that that's why it's called principle, right? Yeah. So we'll start with what it is that really inspired you. Well, thank you, Nitin, and, and, and once again, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be with all of you. Um, I actually started reading about Warren Buffett almost 40 years ago. I was, I was a, um, a trainee in a, in a brokerage firm called Leg Mason in Baltimore, in the summer of uh, 1984, and um, I was a liberal arts major by background and, and had the opportunity to get into the investment business, and I really was somewhat lost. I didn't have a good foundation in accounting or finance or anything like that, and I had thought perhaps I'd made a terrible mistake, but after three weeks of training, the Thursday night uh, of the last week, um, on the last night, they asked us to read a an annual report by Berkshire Hathaway, I mean, by Warren Buffett, which I'd never heard of and didn't know him, uh, you know, about a company called Berkshire Hathaway, which I didn't know anything about as well. And I took the annual report back to the hotel room that night and, and, and began to read it and was instantly depressed because, you know, if you go through an annual uh, a shareholder letter from Warren, you know, in the old days, it was 25, 30 pages, today, maybe a dozen pages, but there's no pictures, there's you know, there's not a lot of graphs or anything. It's just all words. Warren talking about investing, and, and that year I'll never forget. He led off with talking about Rose Blumpkin at Nebraska Furniture Mart and Stan Lipsy at Buffalo News and Chuck Huggins at Seas Candies, and and so all this finance and accounting balance sheets and income statements went, which wasn't resonating with me very well. I could instantly connect to Warren's philosophy that stocks are nothing more than ownership interest in business. If you understand the business, you understand how the business makes money, you understand the people who are running the business, you know, that's about all you need to know. All the other stuff, thinking about markets and economies and trading and all that was unnecessary. And so that fit me. Um, it was the proverbial light bulb goes on and, and that fit my psyche. And so for 10 years, as I went into production, all I did was collect um, information about Warren. I had all the annual reports on Berkshire Hathaway, all the annual reports of the companies that he owned. I read them. Articles in Forbes, Fortune magazines, the Wall Street Journal, all the major publications. I, I, I was like a kid following a ball player. And then it was in the, it was in the, uh, I guess, 1994 that um, 
uh, that we published the Warren Buffett way. And it became an instant uh, New York Times bestseller, a testament not to my writing capabilities, but to the popularity of Warren Buffett. All, all the success of the book is a testament to Warren's success. I would say that. Super. Uh, now let's talk about you know various chapters that you happen to mention in the in the book, right? And uh, one chapter that you know I I kind of liked uh, very much was where uh, Warren Buffett really got his education from. And, yep. and, you know, uh, three greats, again, uh, one of them, uh, Benjamin Graham, who is considered the dean of financial analysis, right? Yep. And he's also the author of The Intelligent Investor, again, a great book, which I've been very fortunate to go through. Uh, the other is uh, Philip Fisher. Uh, he's also written a great book, Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits, right? Yep. And finally, uh, you know, Mr. Charlie Munger, who was vice chairman at, at Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, sadly yeah. passed away uh, last year. He would have been a hundred uh, if you if he had been alive today. Uh, yeah. But please, uh, would request you to to guide us on you know these greats uh, who've been uh, with us uh, earlier and what is it that uh, really you find very interesting about their teachings and what exactly did Mr. Buffett learn from them? Yeah, great question, and and it and it speaks to the timeline. We could even go back earlier and, and talk about the influences of his dad, which was more philosophical uh, than than practical in investing. But let, let's start with with Ben Graham. That that the book that he read uh, after he graduated from uh, uh, University of Nebraska uh, in, in in the spring of, of 1950. Uh, he was 20 years old, and he was in the library where he spent a great deal of time in Omaha in libraries reading books, and came across something called the Intelligent Investor. And for him, you know, that was his proverbial light bulb goes on because he was somewhat lost in the field of investing, trying different strategies. He, was, he even did technical analysis. He was, you know, looking for, you know, different ways in which to outwit the market. But The Intelligent Investor, which was published in 1949, and, and you did mention uh, the seminal book, Security Analysis, written by Graham and Dodd, which is considered to be the holy Bible of value investing. Uh, it spoke to him in a way, uh, very dramatically, that you need to think about stocks as businesses and, and you, you have a margin of safety, which is you try to buy these businesses at a discount to their estimated intrinsic value. And if you do that, uh, you know, good things will happen to you and the bad things will, will be much less. And so he was so moved by the book that he immediately he didn't he didn't know, he thought that they were dead. He thought Ben Graham and David Dodd had passed away years ago. But he had learned in his in his in his research that they were actually teaching a course at uh, at Columbia Business School in New York. He immediately applied that summer, was accepted, and in the fall, September of 1950, he was on campus. His first class was actually with David Dodd, who taught security analysis. And then in the spring of 1951, he took Ben Graham's investment seminar which was a, a, a small seminar of about 20 students that actually went through individual stock analysis. And, and so that, that was his base, right? Ben Graham, margin of safety, the temperament that requires to think about stocks as businesses in a market that's constantly trading and, and it's hyperactive. And, and then so importantly, trying to estimate the value of these businesses and buy them at a discount. And, and that's what drove his partnership returns from 1956 to 1969, which were quite phenomenal. Along the way, he, he, he took a controlling interest in a, in a New England textile company called Berkshire Hathaway in 1965, which he ultimately purchased uh, from the proceeds of his investment partnership. And it, and it cast him, and this is very important, it, where I think he has the competitive advantage. The competitive advantage for Warren Buffett was a simultaneous ownership of businesses where he was acting as an owner of business. You know, he had the Nebraska, he had, I'm sorry, he had a Berkshire Hathaway and started to add businesses to Berkshire Hathaway over time. At the same time, he was investing in the stock market. So the both of them kind of kind of grew together and and he did quite well. But unfortunately the the methods of Ben Graham buying very, very cheap stocks, low price to earnings, low price to book value, low dividend yield, although cheap and perhaps relatively low downside risks were not very good businesses. They weren't, they weren't um, 
they weren't companies that were compounding intrinsic value at a high rate of return. And, and so for him to profit, he would need to trade these cheap companies. You can't buy and hold a mediocre company and think you're going to do well. You had to trade. And, and he did, you know, he kind of pushed back on the whole idea of trading. He did run into the book that you mentioned, Thank You, uh, by Phil Fisher, uh, Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. That was the very first investment book to be a New York Times bestseller. It was a very popular book. He visited Phil Fisher in California, spent time with him. And, and so as much as Ben Graham talked about balance sheets and income statements and buying things on the cheap, Phil Fisher was talking about companies, products, and management and how to buy and hold great companies. So it was filling in the void that he didn't get from, from Ben Graham. And then lastly, and most importantly, and Warren has, has admitted this and confessed this, that uh, you know Charlie Munger is the one most responsible for the current architecture of Berkshire Hathaway today. And he convinced Warren when they made a purchase of C's Candies that it was far better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price than to buy a mediocre company at a cheap price. And so that in 1972 put Berkshire Hathaway on a new, a new plane, if you will, a new pathway of looking for good businesses that generate cash, high returns on capital, and importantly can reinvest the money back into the company that then compounds over time. And you were so right to show the bar graph of compounding. It's quite boring in the early years, but as the years pass and you begin to compound even uh, larger sums of money, the compounding effect, you know, in years five through 10 or 10 through 20 are much more dramatic than the uh, compounding effect of the first five years. So all three played very important roles, but don't, don't uh, discount how important Charlie Munger was to the recipe of Berkshire Hathaway. Right. And, and we'll touch upon uh, Mr. Munger as, as we progress. Uh, yeah. But before that, uh, you know, one other thing that really defines uh, Mr. Coffin is how he uh, looks at risk. You know, risk yeah. can mean a whole lot of things for, for a lot of investors, right? It defines volatility, it defines drawdown, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But as you rightly say, risk for Buffett is inextricably linked to an investor's time horizon. Yeah. And, yeah. And I'd like you to spend some time, uh, you know, uh, on, on that because that is what a lot of uh, investors truly lack, right? That is temperament. Right or the patience really to, to go through uh, you know long phases of uh, you know sort of sideways market. So uh, if I can request you to touch upon that as well. Yeah, I think you know let's let's start with what Buffett doesn't think is risk, because it's it's the bedrock of what's called modern portfolio theory and the standard uh, approach to portfolio management today. And this, you know, this began in the 1950s with Harry Markowitz being a PhD student at, at University of Chicago, and he took it upon himself in his P PhD dissertation to at least propose, in his mind, that, that risk had to do with price volatility. And the more bounciness uh, a stock had, the more riskier it was in his mind. And, and it's interesting to note, Nitin, that, that that whole concept of price as volatility uh, price, I mean, I'm sorry, risk is price volatility and trying to tamp down price volatility. It got nowhere for, you know, from the 1950s into the 1960s. It wasn't until the 73, 74 bear market in the United States that was the worst uh, drawdown bear market since the Great Depression that people began to fumble for what else can we do? And there were all these academicians at, at universities raising their hands saying, hey, we've got an idea. It's, it's price volatility. And of course, people had just lost a lot of money. And of course, they didn't like price volatility. So the whole genesis of modern day money management that exists even today is based upon the Markowitz theory and Bill Sharp with the capital asset pricing model who introduced beta. The demon that they're trying to uh, you know, slay is price volatility. They want a smooth ride. They have a lot of non-correlative assets in the, in the portfolio, and they would much prefer, prefer a smooth 10% ride than a bumpy 15% ride. And, and Warren says exactly the opposite. He goes, I, I much prefer more of a 15% ride than a smooth 10, even if it's more bumpier. So Warren pivoted 
away. Well, he didn't pivot. He was already on that pathway, having learned from Ben Graham that risk was about margin of safety, which is if you bought something for less than it's worth, you're operating with much less risk than someone that would buy a stock at a, at a price over its value. That's a lot of risk. As far as time horizon, a, a, a very important part in it, and, and thank you for bringing that up, he says, yes, it is tied. He says, if you ask me, to, you know, if you bought Coca-Cola today with the idea of selling it ne tomorrow or next week, that's a pretty risky proposition. You really have no idea what the market's going to do, what the price is going to do. But he said, if you bought Coca-Cola today with the idea of holding it for five to 10 years and you bought it at a fair price, if not an undervalued price, then you're taking actually no risk in his mind. So what we have to keep in mind Buffett being a business picker, what I call business driven investing, looks at risk from a totally different 180 degree different perspective than what most people think about as risk, which is price volatility. And that in Buffett's mind has nothing to do with risk. Uh, it's interesting you bring up uh, Coca-Cola because uh, in, in the book you mentioned about uh, a 10 year period and you happen to ask uh, a bunch of students about yeah. uh, whether whether you had held uh, Coca-Cola in your portfolio. And all yeah. of them said yes. Uh, <laughs> we all held it for the last 10 years. And when you asked uh, uh, another question, saying that have you made the same return that uh, Warren Buffett has made? So you yeah. saw very very few hands actually going up. Uh, yeah. And that is testament to, to patience or, or the investment style. And, yeah. I, and, and, and I'd like to kind of elaborate on that through a few case studies, which I'm, I'm sure will, will interest a lot of uh, the listeners today. Uh, the, the, the nine companies that you happen to mention uh, in the book uh, go from the Washington Post uh, to Capital Cities, the Coca-Cola Company, uh, General Dynamics, uh, Wells Fargo, so on and so forth. Uh, yeah. can, can we have some of your insights on maybe three to four uh, such companies? Uh, to get a real sense of the tenets or the investment principles that, that Warren Buffett uh, followed at the time of investment? Well, all you know, what we did in the Warren Buffett way was, you know, actually propose. Now, let me back up. I said, you know, when I was reading all the annual reports of, of, of Berkshire Hathaway for a couple of decades before we wrote the book, it was very clear in my mind uh, that, that Warren was looking at companies, at stocks, stocks as companies, in four different buckets. Uh, he would talk about the company itself. And so we call those the business tenants. And what he's looking for is a simple and understandable company. Do you understand what this company does? Because if you don't, then then you're really on thin ice because you're really not quite certain how the economics of the business works. So you want something that's simple and understandable. You want something uh, that has had a consistent operating history. He always likes to look backwards at base rates um, to think about how this company has performed uh, over different economic cycles. So he likes a consistent operating history as opposed to a new IPO or a turnaround situation that doesn't have a track record. He typically avoids those companies. And then lastly, he wants something that has a, because he's a compounder, he doesn't trade stocks, he buys and holds. He obviously wants a company that has very favorable long-term prospects. That is how long can they continue to earn high cash returns on capital, what he calls a moat or a franchise, if you will, how the competitive advantage period, how long does this last? So we understood from, from our readings that we understood what he looks for in businesses and management. He wanted people that were honest and candid. He found that candor served management well if they were willing to uh, admit their mistakes publicly. They're more likely not to repeat those same mistakes. He liked, uh, you know, obviously uh, resisting the what he called the institutional imperative, which is management's lemming-like attitude of imitating other companies just because other companies are doing that. He said that doesn't make any sense. You do it if it's right for your company, regardless of what any uh, anybody else is doing. And then lastly, rationality for management, which is how do they think about allocating capital, which then being a long-term investor, I assure you the lever of your net worth goes up to the degree that management thinks thoughtfully about how to take the profits of the company and uh, either pay a dividend, buy back stock, or buy new growth. And there's another option, which is, why don't you just put it back into the company? Why don't you reinvest those earnings back into the company? And so we, we had the business and management principles laid out. On the finance, um, 
we, he, he doesn't like earnings per share. He thinks that's kind of a, a smoke screen because a lot of companies do retain earnings per share every year. Their earnings should go up just like a savings account that reinvests its interest every year. That savings account will go up having nothing to do with your management capabilities, just reinvesting money. He likes cash earnings. An owner cash earnings is, you know, EPS and you adjust for uh, uh, depreciation, amortization. But more importantly, you have to build back in your capital reinvestment. All industrial companies in the United States typically will reinvest a good deal of their money just to keep their company going. We looked at high returns on equity. Very important to increase shareholder value that if you earn above the cost of capital, which we would just say is the 10 percent rate of return of the market. Uh, if you earn above the cost of capital, you increase shareholder value. If you earn below the cost of capital, you you discount shareholder value or you basically destroy shareholder value. And we went profit margins and things like that. And then lastly, Ben Graham's margin of safety, buy them all at a discount. So let's back up. He invested $1 billion, which was one third of his portfolio. That's a big bet portfolio, right? He only had three companies, Geico, Washington Post, and then Co uh, Cap Cities. And then he added Coca-Cola. So, you know, he would say, you know, a billion dollar bet. Now, over the 10 years, that billion dollar bet went to 10 billion. Uh, a billion dollars invested in the S&P 500 index went to 3 billion. So he made three times money. So let's go through it. Is Coca-Cola a simple and understandable business? Yes. Does it have a consistent operating history? Yes, about 100 years of operating history. And does it have a favorable long-term outlook? And the answer was obviously yes. I mean, they still had a lot of work to do internationally. Roberto Gazzietta, who had came from Cuba, was the first foreign-born CEO, and he was repositioning Coca-Cola to be basically a syrup business. It was basically a syrup, syrup business. He sold all the disparate uh, companies of theme parks and movie studios and even wine companies and took all that money and kept it in the syrup business. Um, so we liked management. He liked Roberto Gazzietta very, very much. He was buying back stock, which is a rational allocation of capital. And then we looked at the cash earnings, return on equity. All that was really quite positive. And we used a two-stage dividend discount model, which is called the Gordon Growth Model. And under various scenarios of growing at 15%, 12%, 10%, and 8%, um, and discounting that back at, a, at, at close to a 10% rate, which was, I think, the 10-year the uh, the back then, 30-year back then was about 8%. So we discounted it at that rate. He was buying uh, Coca-Cola at a very big discount, no matter what the growth rate. Um, and so when we uh, took the companies, and this would work for Washington Post and Geico and General Dynamics and Cap Cities, all the way to Apple Computer today, um, it, the tenants fit very nicely. We could overlay the stock on the tenants, and there they were. And, and so that's kind of how we thought about uh, Coca-Cola, but that's how we thought about all the businesses that Warren has bought over the years, they seem to line up almost perfectly, not identical every single time, but almost perfectly to the investment tenants that we wrote in the book. Right. Um, is there anything that you you felt Warren missed? I mean, th there are there are multiple articles on on the way uh, you know he didn't get into the the IT companies, the technology companies, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and again, a lot of people say that. You know, Berkshire Hathaway actually underperformed. What do you think about about this? Well, he, you know, we anybody in this business, even the best, you know, the Warren Buffetts, the Bill Millers, the Peter Lynches, go down the list. You know, are going to make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. Um, this, this is a this is a, a business. This is a craft that doesn't lend itself to you know being 100% perfect every time. You're going to make mistakes because they're subjective decision makings that you're making along the way. And you might say, you know, Warren should have stayed out of the airline business and permanently stayed out of the airline business. And, you know, he had trouble at Solomon Brothers, uh, other other issues. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's important to realize that none of this has been a perfect, perfect line, uh, pathway for Warren. But what I would say is a trick in the, in, the, in, the, in the Warren Buffett way is not only, one, uh, making more correct decisions than wrong decisions. So you want to have a a pretty good uh, batting uh, average there. But importantly, what he did was what we call slugging percentage, which is not only did you win, but you held on to it and let it compound. And so then it really becomes uh, not a frequency question of how many times you're right, less how many times you're wrong. It's how much money you make when you're right. <laughs> 
less how much money you give back when you're wrong. So if you look at the money that he made in Washington Post and Geico and Cap Cities and, and Coca-Cola and, and you keep going General Dynamics, American Express, just keep going up the list. Those were magnitude bets. Those were things that paid off extremely well, which more than compensated for the mistakes that he made in different companies. Now, to your point, he was late in technology and admitted that he was late in technology. Now, he would say, um, a lot of people said, and perhaps I even said it at one time, is that he just didn't fully understand what was going on in technology, particularly in the 1990s and the advent of the internet. But he would say, yes, I understood it very well. I just don't think it had a consistent operating history. There were a lot of new IPOs. The internet was just beginning. There were no you know, consistent operating histories. From, and I didn't know who the winners were going to be. And so I stayed out of that game. And that's fair. I, you know, I get that. I did have the fortune of, of, of managing money for 14 years with Bill Miller at Lake Mason Capital Management. Bill, as some of you may know, was the first uh, mutual fund manager to beat the stock market 15 years in a row. Uh, which was quite phenomenal, but he was also the first in, uh, value investor to crack the code on technology. And he owned uh, Dell Computer in the 1990s. He owned America Online in the 1990s, made a ton of money. A lot of that work came out of the Santa Fe Institute, which is a research institute in New Mexico that studies complex adaptive systems that we spend a lot of time at. And it helped us understand the franchise, the network effects, the, 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 the moat that surrounds these companies. And then Bill went on to buy Amazon and Google, and, and that was phenomenal. So Warren said, yeah, and Charlie said, yeah, we missed it. We missed Amazon. Uh, you know, Amazon was right there for the taking. He even, you know, even used Amazon to buy books, right? Yeah. And Charlie said, yeah, I miss Google. You know, Geico was, you know, sending a nickel to Google every time somebody clicked on a Geico ad on the Internet. And he goes, all this money was going to Google, and we didn't even pay attention to it. And so they they do admit that they missed those stocks in the game, early game. But then Charlie went on to say that when Warren bought, uh, you know, Apple starting in 2016, actually it was Ted Wexler that started buying it in 2016, and then Warren added significantly to it, you know, ultimately investing close to $35 billion uh, that became $160 billion of five bagger in less than 10 years. <laughs> so Charlie said, well, maybe that's our atonement, that our forgiveness for, you know, we got Apple, but we didn't get uh, Google and and uh, and uh, he didn't get Google and Amazon, but he got Apple and Apple paid him phenomenally well. So a little late to the game, but more importantly, he is in the game, right? So if you think about it, the, the single largest stock in the portfolio is a technology company. Uh, the single, uh, and he, can, he thinks it's basically the second most valuable part of Berkshire Hathaway, because he doesn't think about Apple as a common stock, he thinks about it as a business. So his first most valuable business is the insurance operations run by Xi Jian, who's brilliant. Uh, that would be the, the, the most valuable part of Berkshire Hathaway. The second is Apple. The third then is Berkshire Hathaway Energy, uh, which you know has its oil investments, uh, utilities, solar energy, and things of that nature. And then the fourth is just the compilation uh, you know, would be uh, uh, things like uh, the uh, uh, the railroad business and things like that um, or that. So, you know, what I would say is Warren evolved uh, over time, maybe not as quickly as we would have liked to have seen him evolve, but he did evolve and he got to technology somewhat late. But it's amazing you could buy Apple at 2000, you know, in 2016 and, you know, here we are eight years later and uh, that's a five bagger. And that at the time was one of the largest companies in the world. And it, it speaks to, I think, that it's not just the small cap companies that can double and triple. If you've got the right big cap company, you can make a lot of money as well. Right. I, I mentioned at the start that I, I'd like to ask you about your your other uh, book as well, which is Lattice Work, uh, The yeah. New Investing. And, and two of those legends that you've already mentioned, uh, Charlie Munger and, and Bill Miller. Uh, yeah. would request you to focus a little bit about on what is it that investors can learn from each one of them. Different yeah. different styles uh, yeah. and, and different to Warren Buffett as well. Uh, yeah. You know, Charlie Munger, as you mentioned, was one of the mentors to, yeah. to Warren Buffett. So yeah. your, your guidance. Yeah, I, you know, next to the Warren Buffett way, that that, that book, and, and let me say, you know, thank you. The, the mention of the book, in, uh, uh, it's called Lattice Work, The New Investing. That was published in 2000. And I'll give you the genesis of that. It's now been retitled because that title didn't work very well. First of all, it came out in a bear market. Investment books don't do well in 
bear markets, but we retitled it Investing the Last Liberal Art. And today, if you look up on Amazon, Investing the Last Liberal Art, uh, it's in its second edition. We we wrote a second edition in, in the early 2010 period. Um, and it basically took up the challenge that Charlie Munger gave to us all in a lecture in 1994 that he gave at the University of Southern California Business School, uh, Professor Babcock um, had invited Charlie Munger to come and speak to the class and the class thought that they were gonna get some stock picks and, and Charlie kind of fooled him. He says, we're not gonna talk about the market, we're gonna talk about something more important, which is the art of achieving worldly wisdom, which I'm sure made their eyes roll counterclockwise and back in their head. But he said, basically, you know, to actually really get good at this business, you need to be a multidisciplined thinker and you need to import all the major mental models from all the major disciplines. And, and so we took it upon ourselves to start to outline that. So if you were a liberal arts major, you know, you got to take a physics course and a biology course and a, and a mathematics course, but you then also take a sociology course, a psychology course, a, a literature course. So you're doing multidiscipline thinking. And what we did in the book was tease out the major mental models of each of the disciplines and give them examples of how this might relate to markets. And, and it became a quite a big success. Uh, Charlie, Charlie appreciated the book. He sent me a note and said that I was on the right pathway. But we think that that's kind of the missing ingredient. Charlie used to say, a man with only a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you only know finance and accounting and nothing else, then you're solving everything just from an accounting and economic uh, standpoint. You may think that's enough, but when you begin to explore physics, biology, math, uh, psychology, philosophy, on down the list, uh, your, your, your sight lines uh, not only get farther, but much wider, and you begin to see things that are gonna aid you uh, in how you uh, think about investing. And I would note, uh, knitting on a side note, that the CFA, I'm a chartered financial analyst, I know there are many CFAs in India as well, uh, had a survey asking uh, the CEOs of asset management companies what they thought was the most important trait that they were looking for when they hire uh, new employees to their company. First on the list was creativity, which we th we think that you know that would make sense. You know, you want to kind of think about new ways to solve all problems. But number two on the list, right behind it, was being a multidisciplined thinker. So I I, I often counsel uh, college students, young people that are in the business. I said, okay, you know, you, you've got a great college degree, you're very smart, you may be a CFA, you understand accounting and finance, but I would also tell them to spend some time uh, in the other disciplines, the other sciences, and learning how to do that. And then Bill Miller, working with Bill as we got to the Santa Fe Institute, was the practicality. People said, you know, you did your thesis on Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger as a PhD dissertation, but the practicals, when you really were in the field actually investing, the practicals I learned from Bill Miller. And Bill was an, was continues to be, he's now chairman emeritus at the Santa Fe Institute, but continues to be a strong supporter of that institute. And that institute is a multidiscipline research institute uh, that is pulling scientists from all across the disciplines to help them better understand what is called a complex adaptive system, which is the identification of the economy in the stock market. So it, it's well worth your time. Now, I would say in conclusion, it's not necessary for you to be an expert in every one of these disciplines. We're not looking for you to write a, a you know, your dissertation on physics and then a dissertation on biology. You don't have, you just need to grab the major talking points, the major understanding. And when you do that, uh, the payoff, as, as Charlie says, is La Paluzza. You know, you, it's turbocharged, right? You, the payoff from being a multidisciplined thinker is far greater than the sum of the parts. It, it really becomes quite powerful. Right. Uh, now coming to the behavioral aspect, you know, as, as again, as, as Mr. Warren Buffett puts it, uh, intellect is just about 10% of whatever you do, but it's the temperament uh, which has yeah. uh, the remaining. And, uh, you know, your, your inputs on, on that would be well appreciated because, uh, you know, we, we've seen, especially post, post the pandemic, uh, market yeah. cycles have kind of shortened out a little yeah. bit, right? Uh, yeah. and, and there are, there are periods where it, it kind of tests investor patience, right? Uh, markets do tend to get erratic in the short term, although everyone yeah. believes that if the fundamentals are strong, 
then yeah. stock markets uh, eventually are, are, are slaves of earnings growth. They should catch up. But how do you put that into into practical uh, you know behavior? How does one go through or or yeah. overcome those temptations to overreact? Excellent question, and 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 you and you point out in it, and probably the the one aspect of being a successful investor that Warren talks about that I did not emphasize enough in the original book. We talked about it later in a book called The Money Mind, which is the philosophical interpretation of Warren Buffett. But I had thought that all you needed to do was just figure out what these businesses were worth, and the client would naturally embrace that as a great investment. But but you know people that. I, let me back up. I, I've never known anybody that doesn't want to invest like Warren Buffett. I said, look, here's Warren Buffett. This is what he does. This is how he does it. Do you think you want to do that? They all say yes. You know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and then when they get in the game, they find out that it's, it's, it's emotionally, psychologically difficult because we're asking them to buy and hold great companies to compound intrinsic value at a high rate of return over time, which is not going to oblige us to do it every week, every month, every quarter, every year. But it does work out, as Ben Graham said, the weighing machine over time uh, will move price for the economics, you know, erratically, but it gets there. And what I finally discovered, and Warren talks about this, it's the temperament that keeps you in the game, right? As you rightly point out, you, you have a good portfolio, but then the market starts changing, right? The market evolves, it adapts, it does different things. It likes oil stocks now, and then next week it likes healthcare stocks, and then it's up, and then it's down. And that's all price, right? But that's just, that's what prices are doing. That's not necessarily what your businesses are doing. It's what your prices are doing. And, and the real key, as Warren says, you've got to disengage yourself from the stock market. You look at it from afar. You're not immersed in it every single day. Now, as professionals, you know, we have to stay on top of the game, but that doesn't mean that we have to act on it every single day. We act on it when it's our best interest to do so. And Warren would say, that's the problem. People say, you know, I own Coca-Cola, but oil stocks are going up. Sell Coca-Cola, buy an oil stock. Or then you own the oil stocks, and lo and behold, it's all over there in the um, in the pharmaceuticals and the healthcare side, you know, the, the new drugs that they're in. So you sell the oil, and you got, so you're constantly moving the portfolio around. But then when you look back, you know, as we have done in our portfolio, we have, I don't know, 23 stocks in our portfolio. Ten of them I've held for nine and a half years. <laughs> so, you know. And, and I assure you, those 10 stocks, and they've done extremely well, or they wouldn't be in the portfolio for uh, nine and a half years. Um, if we look back on them, they, they have periods where they underperform quarter to quarter, you know, month to month. And sometimes it's the, the value regime that's doing well, and sometimes it's the growth regime doing well. You'll never, you'll never figure that out, when to do that and, and forecasting it. But if you own a good company that's compounding economics at high rates of return, the trick is to, to hold on to it. The challenge is having the right temperament that says, okay, the market's changing, but I still have a good business, right? I have a good business and I'm not going to sell my good business just because the market temporarily wants to go over there. Now, what I want to leave you with too also is something that, that we're working on right now, which is looking at the changing structures of markets. And, and, and the market structure has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. The largest amount of asset flows outside of alternatives, you know, we take private equity off the books, take venture capital off the books, but just look at active uh, stock Well, the greatest, greatest under management is not to business-driven investors like Warren Buffett and myself and others. Uh, it's gone into algorithmic quant-driven funds that are more macro in nature, high-frequency traders, uh, levered, and you can see it if you look at your your screen on any one day and it and in the first minute the market's open it either turns instantly green or instantly red every single company right well those are the algos that that's the quant driven funds and they're doing price arbitrage now they're very smart i mean if you read books about you know jim simmons at renaissance and kevin griffith at citadel and other different these guys are very very smart at arbitrage in different different prices with different derivatives and options and futures and back and forth. They use ETFs like the Russell 1000 growth, Russell 1000 value, which makes all stocks go up or down indiscriminately. These guys have most of the money and, and they're in charge of the market in a short term basis. And that makes it more challenging because we do see um, these big changes in markets that affect our underlying companies. But what we have to spend time with with our clients is 
just because this is going on in the short term basis doesn't mean that we have we don't have a good company. And we remind them about the economics of what we own and how those economics over time translate into price. But the, the biggest hurdle, the biggest job that I have as, a, as an investment manager, portfolio manager, is just keeping people quiet in their seats. Stay, stay calm. It's going to be OK. Uh, just because Apple didn't outperform this quarter or this month uh, doesn't mean it's not a good business. Hang on there. I, I've owned Apple for nine and a half years. I bought it two years before Todd and Warren did. It was probably the first time I ever ever bought it. And, um, and and we've kept it for nine and a half years. It's been the single best performing stock in the portfolio, a 30% compounded annual return over the last nine and a half years. So huge, huge, huge returns. Apple did not beat the market every quarter, every month, right? And here we are in January and everybody's telling you right now, Apple and the other tech stocks are down because of profit taking after their great run in 2023. But they want you to trade Apple. I can't tell you how many times in the last nine and a half years I've heard an analyst say, it's time to sell it. You'll buy it back later, which often is very difficult to do. You sell it, but then you never buy it back correctly. You buy it back probably higher than where you sold it. So I've seen, you know, MasterCard, Apple, Louis Vuitton, uh, companies that we've had in the portfolio for nine and a half years. Great companies, great business. If your net, your family's net worth was tied singularly to any one of those companies, you'd have done very well. But if you relied on the stock market to tell you whether you were doing very well, you're probably right about, I don't know, half the time, a third of the time, and the rest of the time, something else was working. So we really have to spend a lot of time educating our clients that price is not the ultimate, you know, price is not the determining factor. Ultimately, it is over time, but multiple years, right? Not multiple weeks or months, multiple years. So we have to get them back to understanding the economics of what they own. And if they agree the economics are are, are, are good, above average, uh, then they're more likely to sit still and ride out the volatility. If they don't understand the company, don't understand the economics, don't understand the compounding potential of owning these companies, uh, they, they really struggle. And, and this will be my last point. So 2022 was a tough year for growth investors. Um, you know, I think we were, after being up three years in a row, I think, you know, we were down close to 29% in 2022. And it was very clear to me that, 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 that the growth stocks had gotten massively oversold by the third quarter of 2022. And so, you know, I said to my people, I said, look, um, you know, uh, I understand we're down in price, but I looked at the economics. It looks like that they're significantly undervalued. I think, um, you know, uh, the market is overshot. These things will work themselves back out. If you do anything, if you're not willing to buy us at this price, which is cheaper than I've ever been in my nine and a half years, the cheapest I've ever been, don't sell me. And the, the advisors called and said, Robert, you know, my clients, they're unhappy. Uh, they, they don't like being down 29 percent. And uh, but we're hanging in there. And I said, well, how, how are you doing it? How do you keep them doing it? And he goes, well, they just look at the names in your portfolio and they go, Apple. I don't want to sell that. Amazon. No, that's a, I'm not going to sell Amazon. Louis Vuitton. What if I? So when they look at the names, they understand the quality of the names. It helps them overcome the anxiety that is associated with high volatility of prices going up and down. So we take them back to the business, go back to the business. What do you own? What is your company? And when they get that solidified in their thinking, it allows them to navigate the markets much easier. Uh, uh, very, very insightful. Uh, I, I'd like to take a couple of questions that have come in from, from the participants. Uh, one of them happens to mention that, you know, Warren started really early. Uh, that, is, that is a key to the success, right? That you, you start early and you benefit from the power of compounding over the long term. Yeah. But let's say you, you happen to start late and you are in yeah. your, your 50s. Uh, yeah. You know, how, and, and having now realized, you know, what you've missed, uh, what is it that you should do and what more importantly is something that you shouldn't do? Yeah. Well, what, what you shouldn't do is try to race to catch up because you're going to do a lot of trading and a lot of speculating. And, and that that's not a high probability bet for most people. And so th this 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 kind of idea that I'm, I'm late, I'm 50s, I'm going to retire, I better hurry up and make a lot, of, make as much money in the shortest period of time. It's basically speculating. And, and, and that speculation doesn't have a good odds on outcome for most people. I would say if you're 50 years old or 30 years old or 60 years old, or even 70 years old with, you know, life expectancies um, moving, well, into the 90s, you know, 
you'd be you'd be amazed at the compounding factors over 10 years. I mean, when I look at my portfolio, you know, what we've been able to do over 10 years. Um, and so a 60 year old person who owned uh, my portfolio 10 years ago is a very happy 70 year old today. Uh, and we've you know done better in the market with less anxiety, less uh, aggravation. So it doesn't matter your age. I think you want no matter your age, you want to do something sensible, thoughtful, that has a high probability of generating a, a good return. And when you add all those things up, it still comes back to what I call business driven investing. Stocks are businesses, find a good business, buy it at a fair value. And as long as its economics are progressing satisfactorily, uh, your price will uh, also advance uh, satisfactorily. So don't don't let Warren doing this at when he was 20 years old and now has $100 billion. You know, I'll never get well, nobody's going to get $100 billion. And, you know, he started with a lot more money. But but the process, the strategy of business driven investing to me is is the most optimal approach, no matter what your age. And uh, the other question is that, uh, you know, these these books are so insightful, you know, um, but what does one have to do? Uh, let's say a layman, what does one have to do beyond just reading these books? Well, what else should I do to become a fairly successful investor? Uh, turn off the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> Spend less time watching financial news and spend more time reading. And this goes to Charlie Munger. I mean, you know, God rest his soul. Uh, you know, he left us on November 28th. He didn't, he, we were hoping he'd make it to 100 on January 1st. It'll be hard for us at Omaha this year not to not to see Charlie up on the stage with Warren. Uh, but Charlie says, you know, I don't have the quote exactly right, but he says, I've met no wise person, no successful person that didn't read all the time. So all those hours uh, that you're spending watching TV, all those hours that you're, you know, reading short-term nonsense, read about your company, read annual reports, read industry magazines. And then Charlie would say, read a book on history, read a book on uh, biology to think about how markets change. And he said, you know, no wise person became a wise person without reading a lot. And so just reallocate your time away from the short-term noise. And remember, financial news networks on TV, they're selling eyeballs. It's an advertising-based business, right? The most popular uh, cable uh, network in the United States during hurricane season is the Weather Channel. They love to put hurricanes on the Weather Channel. Why? Because people are attracted to that drama. And in many ways, what I think happens in markets, people get um, attracted to the drama in the stock market on any point in, on any point in time. They're just absorbed by it. And, and you really have to put up, you have to put up, uh, you know, blinders on that. So... Uh, that's kind of what's running through our mind um, is try to spend more time not thinking about the market and more time thinking about um, uh, our businesses. Uh, I'd just like to end this uh, very, very interesting session with, with one last thing that I, I learned from the book, uh, also that you happen to mention, is about rational allocation of capital. Now, uh, we uh, in the financial markets talk about asset allocation and, and adhering to those principles uh, and kind of reviewing them on a periodic basis. Uh, but if you're an equity investor uh, and you happen to mention about different styles, growth, value, so on and so forth, uh, what are the key tenets that you would want to impart about rational allocation of capital? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, your question is, it's, it's the rational allocation, the most important part, is that your question? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, if you're a buy and hold answer, a buy and hold investor, the answer is absolutely yes. It's the most important thing because how management allocates that capital ultimately determines uh, the future intrinsic value of the business. If you allocate capital responsibly, rationally, in projects that earn above the cost of capital that keep the business going because they're value creating strategies, you're going to do very well. But if you have a management that you know, goes out and tries to buy growth and, and, and that's how they allocate capital and they can't integrate it properly in the company or they stupidly buy back stock, but the stock is above the intrinsic value of the business. That destroys value. So rational allocation of capital by management is, 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 is likely, you know, up there is the top one, two things that you need to be thinking about if you're going to own something for three, five, 10 years. It's how they're allocating capital and they should be able to explain it to you sensibly. If you look at Tim Cook at 
Apple, uh, you know, he'll tell you exactly what he's doing and why he's doing it. And it's amazing if you think about it, they bought back almost half their stock in the last 10 years on the way to becoming a $3 trillion business. That's a heck of a capital allocation success story. Uh, and so, you know, they're doing another $90 billion share repurchase this year. They gush so much cash because they earn 100% return on equity, even higher in the services business. They have so much cash, they can't put it to work. So what is Tim Cook doing? Well, he, put, he does reinvest, you know, in the neighborhood of, you know, maybe $30 billion a year back into the company. But the rest of it, you know, he pays a dividend, he buys back stock. And, and that, that's been a big, important part of, 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 of the total return of Apple. Well, Robert, I uh, can't thank you enough. It's been a yeah. very, very insightful uh, session. And I'd like to uh, thank you uh, really for, for spending this time with us and, and giving yeah. such valuable insights to all the participants. Right. Well, listen, I appreciate the invitation. Thank you so much. I wish all of you the best in India. Great success in the market. And, 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 and Nitin, once again, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening.